Nice as you can. Here at Hit the Deck 2013, I'm of Army Freshman. Yes, sir. How, how is life for Chris? Um, oh, life is good. Enjoying myself. Happy to be in the UK. Um, we're only here for a real short trip. We're out here at a headline show, doing Hit the Deck, and then we're playing the Aquabats tomorrow night in London, which I'm really excited about. So it's too quick of a trip, really. You know what they say about vacations? Like two weeks is too long, but a week isn't enough. This is like a week trip, and I just felt like I need a couple more days. I'm like panicking. I'm like, man, if I don't get my party in this night tomorrow, I'm gonna I'm gonna be back at work next week. So I better go for it. You know? And it's, there's some usual few guys to play such a shot around here. I mean, I know historically you've always done quite long runs around the UK. Yes, across. that's true. It just kind of worked out that way when we got the offer for this. There wasn't really anything else in place to tie it to, but we still really wanted to come over because we had a new record. So we sort of thought, oh man, if we miss this opportunity, you know, over here, maybe another opportunity doesn't come for a while. So we said, let's do a quickie and hopefully it'll lead to setting something up. Um, you know, at the end of the day. So we're hoping to be back. So, I know, so you've been here like the big two days. Flew over from California. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Are you feeling the jet lag? Or I like mom. Um, we did a good job oh, of fighting. You know, we've been, we've been fighting. Yeah, the first thing I woke up for like three hours and I forced myself to go back to sleep. So I'm pretty good. You get a little tired here and there, but I think that's one thing that um, people don't understand about um, touring over here is the jet lag factor. It's it's real. It's real. I'm not just making that up. If you catch a band on the first night of their English tour, you will invariably see a lesser show than if you catch them. Yeah, you know what I mean? It's just something that I'll be You know what I mean? Like, it gets you, it really messes with you. Even psychologically, you start to go crazy. You know? Seriously. Uh, how have you been so far? We're down here the first one year that they did it. And I kind of felt like, uh, uh, as you're doing it, you're doing it. So I'll try to talk about it. I kind of feel that. Uh, I mean, to be frank, and we talked about it a little bit, the venues are too far. Yeah. It, it, it just didn't feel like a festival. It felt like five different shows. You know, kids would just commit to one stage, whereas here, where they've done it before and they had it down, all the venues are in the same place. So you feel like it's more, you have the opportunity to go see different stuff. I've already walked, I've already been in four venues, technical venues, yeah. in, in 30 minutes, whereas yesterday I could have been at max two venues in 30 minutes. It makes it much more, I think the bands like it more. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, how did the crowd react to, to your show? Yesterday was good, but again, I mean, I just think it's tough getting people out when it, things are very far like that, you know? And then tonight we're playing against We Are The In Crowd, a band that I actually like a lot, but they're blowing up and they're kind of one of the more popular bands on this fest and we're one of the more popular bands. So I'm like, oh great. So we finally get the stages right, but then we got to go against somebody really big. And yeah. you know, when somebody's planning on seeing one band, and if they're going to see that band, it's hard to pull them to play. So sometimes the benefit of headlining your stage or playing later, can yes, there's more people walking around, but maybe there ain't as many people for you because if you would have played at two in the afternoon, I'll oh, totally I'll come see you. But if you're playing at eight o'clock, well I got plans. You know? So it's all these things are always a roll of the dice, but you try and have as much fun as possible. You know? Would you say the the energy of your live show lends itself? To good to festivals like this? It absolutely does, but I feel it helps more in outdoor festivals where you don't have to commit to a stage because we get walked by traffic. We're one of those bands that somebody sees it, they're like, oh, well, who's this? Or, oh, well, that sounds exciting. Or, well, something fun's going on over there. So we really have the ability to pull people and play download, sonosphere. We may be on a small stage, but we'll pack it by the end. But here, when you're in that club, Hey, that's it. Whoever walked in to see you is who you get. Maybe five people, maybe 50 people, but you got to work with what you have. And sometimes that's frustrating because even today, let's say we have a small crowd tonight when we play, you know, I'll know that there's 2,000 people within a block vicinity that can't see this. And it's like, oh God, if only they had a chance to see it, it could be so much more. So, oh, there's... There's negative aspects to indoor festivals, you know, but when it's raining and it's an indoor festival, it's the greatest idea in the world. So I'm not complaining, I'm just discussing yeah. the technical side of it. I mean, you hope, I know AOF has always had a good UK fan base, so mm -hmm. you're hoping that that will see through and that kids will maybe make the choice to come see you rather than say, oh, we have a crowd. Um, yeah. You know, again, uh, since we're having a philosophical festival conversation, something that I find is a lot of kids. Um, if they've seen you before, if you've been here before, they will opt to see the hot band, the flavor of the week band. Um, and I don't mean it in a negative way, but whoever's really happy at this particular festival, Don 
Broco, 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 Don Broco is happening. They're blowing up right now. And there's kids that, even though they're probably going to have 10 chances to see Don Broco in the next six months because they're going to tour, tour, tour and make some money, they will still go see them over someone else because right now they're happening. They want to say that they saw them right now when they were on the cover of Kerrang! Not six months later, you know. Is it, is it strange for you coming to these kind of festivals and seeing the young bands when you, you guys have been in the race for 15 years now? It's a great question. Um, yes, it is. It is. When some of these bands that I see and I'm just like, God, like, these guys are young. Like, young. Like, I remember rock kind of almost being like an old man's game. Like, those guys on stage, they were older than you, you know? And kids start playing music so young now that the quality of the band can be better at a younger age. You'll see a band of 19, 20, 22, 23 year olds that are pretty goddamn good. And before the old adage was you needed to be deep into your 20s before as a band you were really good, you know? But bands start younger now, which is a good thing. And I'm not complaining about that. I know. Yeah, it's cool. it's cool. It's cool to see. I mean, and they're not that much younger, but there's that weird thing, man, when you, you know, you're in your early 30s and you meet somebody in their early 20s, they feel like it feels like a different world. It feels like, you know, a band in their 30s versus a band in their 20s. You feel like you're 40 years old compared to somebody like they must be 15 years old. You know, it's just such a different world. You know? So anyway, I think that was I think that was Never Shout Never. I have no idea. Yeah, Never Shout Never just walked past us. The guy has cool hair. Nice. That's funny. <laughs> I think it's funny. Um, do you think you can know big bands by the hair? <laughs> do you think uh, that stuff like this, that the, the young bands necessarily take the time that they sh could or should to learn from guys like yourselves who have seen it, been there, done it, seen it? I certainly don't want to sound like the whiny old man because no. that's you know that's not what I mean by this. But yes, I agree with you. Um, and not for me per se. I may not have any wisdom versus the next asshole, but. Um, uh, when we were younger, we really did study the bands that had been out there for a while. When Army of Freshmen started, if we played with a band that had been doing it for a while and was successful, we studied. We watched the show, we looked at the merch, I mean, we really tried to engross ourselves with how do they do it, how can we do what they do? And I don't see that as much, man. A lot of the younger bands, to be quite honest with you, we're just doing our own thing, we're just doing it. And I think culture's changed a little bit. I don't think that's a bad thing, that's okay, it's good, everybody should discover things on their own. Yeah. But you also see some mistakes that some of these bands make, and it's like, man, you know, well, right. I may regret that in a couple of years, and I do see now a lot of bands don't last long. I feel like bands back in the day lasted a little longer. Now, we were talking about earlier, um, they just changed their name. You know, over especially in the UK, it's a weird phenomenon, but it's like we're gonna get together and work really hard for a year and then sort of work less hard for another year. And if nothing's happened or what we think hasn't happened, we'll kind of change the sound a little bit and, um, which we call change the sound a little bit, and change our name. Yeah. You know, I have a friend's band that played that I just watched today that I like a whole lot, no names mentioned, and they were a great band and they're changing their name and they just played their last show and it's like, it sucks that you have to change your name. It sucks that you can't take those two or three years you had as that band and the work that you did and have that count for something instead of just starting fresh. But over here, it's a lot more accepted. You know, yeah. I don't think you see that in the states as much. You know, you're so small here. Somebody finds out about a band and if they don't dig it or they don't like it, it's what are you gonna do? You're stuck. You know. In America, it's a lot bigger. You know, maybe if one area doesn't like it, you can sort of shift focus to another area and find a place that digs. You know? Yeah. As, as a young band, how helpful was it to have older kind of modern bands like Bon Jovi kind of take over that wing? It was imperative. It was imperative. I mean, even a band like Bowling for Soup, who I love and have a lot of respect for, we learned from them. I mean, we had been a band for quite a few years when we first even met them. We knew what we were doing, but there were still things we learned. You know, and there were still things we saw. And, how to treat certain people in different situations, or even to figure out when when do you need a sound man? When do you need this? What you know, all those kind of things you learn from bands when you go out with them. And I like to think that I'm still learning for that matter. Like first thing I did was I went and talked to the merch guy from uh, one of the bands that played today because I I could learn. Hey, what are you selling? What's working for you? How is this experience? You know, I just I like meet people. I like hanging out. I like. I like these events because you can meet a lot of people and connect with a lot of people in one time that maybe you couldn't on the course of a regular show. I don't necessarily think people take advantage of that like they should, you know, but teach his own. 
an uh, offer you have just recently put out a new record. Mm -hmm. Of many of your, your historic career. Uh, <laughs> what is that record called? For it's called Hackney's Happy to Be Alive. And uh, where did the album come from? Uh, honestly, two things. My dad uh, had uh, an issue several years ago, a health issue, and now he always says if he has to know, he's doing Happy to Be Alive. So that's one half of it. The other half is we as a band, we're just happy to still be here because all our peers and bands are our friends and bands that started when we did, they're not around anymore. With exception, but we're still doing it. No, we never got huge. No, we never made a lot of money. I'm aware of this, you know. But at the same time, we still get to do it, you know. We still get to have an opportunity, like, get the deck come up, where we can get together and be friends and make music and go hang out in a foreign country and have a great time. And I want to still be able to do that. So we are we're happy to be here. We could complain about maybe what we haven't achieved, but I think we're just happy to still be in the game, you know, because nothing happens if you don't show up. How how is New York compared to? Uh, uh, 10, you know, ago, everybody says that you know, our new record is a little more mature. I, I can fairly say that I think our new record is a little more mature because lyrically it deals with some stuff that's maybe a little more serious than some of the stuff on the past record, um, which is fun for me as a writer, you know, as a lyricist. Um, but at the same time, I think it's a little crunchier, it's a little more rock. But when I say that, it's not heavy by yeah. any stretch of the imagination. We like hooks, we like writing songs, we like catchy melodies. We will always have that. I can't ever see us getting the haircuts and the makeup and the tattoos and you know making a record that has screaming on it. It's just it's just not who we are, you know. But I think we've grown as songwriters, so I'm really proud of it. But the music industry has changed so much. I think we made our best record at a time when people pay less attention to records. So it's like, oh geez, you know, I wish we would have put the thing that we're most proud out about back when people were still actively buying records or listening to records as a full artistic concept versus the single culture that we live in now. Yeah. I mean, is it kind of inevitable that eventually you would write a more mature record? Do you think like, yeah, we've been at this for 50 years, we can't write some dropping off of teenagers anymore? Yeah, yeah, I think that's fair. But you know, even that, you know, I think there's a misconception of our name, unfortunately, because we're called Army of Freshmen. It's just, you know, you give yourself that name when you're 18 years old, you don't think you're going to be using it when you're 30, you know. Um, but because of the, a name like that, I think that there's, a, there's an element of people think that we're maybe a little more immature than we are. And if they would listen to some of the records, they'd be like, okay, yeah, it's pop songs and it's rock songs, but these guys aren't talking about drinking beers and parties. You know what I'm saying? Like, there's more going on there. And maybe this is the record that really kind of just puts that home. What kind of stuff did you write about on the record? Um, you know, um, we got a song about, you know, uh, you know, it's a heavy topic, but like what alcoholism can do to a family and a relationship. We've got a song about, you know, your life, legacy, death, losing a loved one. Um, but it's done in our way. It's not done in a way that, let's say, is super, super moby, for lack of a better word. And I think that's a cool just, juxtaposition of a band that's a little more popular and a little more hook-oriented. Maybe writing about some more serious topics, how would they present it versus another band that would tune to Drop D and sing some, you know, screamy, depressive stuff. Like, okay, how do you put, like, you know, losing your grandmother in a melody that someone can sing but still understand that it means something? So in that aspect, I'm really, really proud of the record. And I hope over the next months to a year, it's just one of these ones that just takes a while. I just hope it's one of these ones that slowly somebody takes the time to listen to it and says, dude, you gotta listen to this pretty good. Versus what happens now is you put out a record, everybody listen, all your fans buy it and listen to it for two weeks, and then they're on to the next thing. Yeah. We made a record that can stick around, whether it will, we need to see. You know? uh, I, I read that you worked with Jay Rustin to produce a record, how to work with, what he brings to the process. He's great, he's awesome. Um, he uh, is really getting big in the metal community right now, oddly enough, doing the Anthrax records and the Steel Panther records, but before that, we worked with him. And uh, he's, he's just a wonderful guy. It's good to see him getting some success and some recognition now. Um, because even as producers, the producer racket is as difficult as the band racket. It's not harder, to be honest with you. Because back in the day, those guys always got paid. Now, Jay, if you're watching this, you know, like, you know, we still own a couple bucks for the record. I mean, bands are just so broke right now versus having those labels that did the big budgets where producers always got taken care of, you know. I just wanted to talk a little bit about the fact that you, you have hit that 15th anniversary of the band, which mm -hmm. congratulations for that, and that is Thank you. It, impressive that you've made that. Thank you what, what are your most kind of vivid memories of the last 15 years? Wow, oh, um, you know, I think the, the events, a lot of the festival oriented stuff is really cool. Playing Grows Rock in Belgium, playing Download, playing um, 
um, Summer Sonic in Japan. It seems like every two or three years we get a big festival, you know, and that's cool because as a music fan, which I desperately am and still am, always been, it's cool to be around people that you grew up listening to, to be part of that community in any way is a really, it's, it's that validation. And even if it's kind of a self-gratifying ego validation, you're, it's still a validation like, wow, I'm here with these people and not because I bought a ticket and I'm in the back of the crowd and I'm a hardcore fan, but they wouldn't know me from, yeah. you know, it's, I, those moments are really cool. But even just today, we were in the car, all of us, and everyone's in a good mood and got some sleep and we threw on some pop punk songs from the early 2000s and just did a mega mix and we're pumping it and we were singing along. And I had a moment where I'm like, this is what it's really about. Like, you know, being with your friends and having a good time. And the older you get, honestly, I think for everybody, the less you get to do that and the more you should appreciate it when you do, and that's what I'm trying to do here is appreciate it. And even after having this nice, deep, philosophical conversation with you um, in a hotel, a fancy hotel lobby, like, I I'm gonna leave here and be like, hey, that's another reason just to be upbeat. Like, that's cool, talking to somebody sitting in a hotel room, playing a show in an hour or so, like, should just be happy that I'm here, you know? Hopefully it gives me the, you know, the, uh, the energy to just invite a few more kids to the show because I know the 20 year old version of myself would be out there talking to every single kid. But you get a little older, you get a little tired. Sometimes you almost feel uncomfortable being a grown man going up to a 15 year old and inviting him to a show. But what are you supposed to do? You're not one of the bands that everybody is going to see. And you're well aware of the fact you can play in front of no one. And do you really want to come somewhere and play in front of some no one? So therefore, you do have to talk to these kids. But it's still a little uncomfortable, especially because kids have no social skills now. So you're talking to some girl who's got her head buried in the phone, like, yeah, well, you want me to come to your band? Cool. You know what I mean? So it's like, it can be a little daunting sometimes. Is it uh, harder now than it necessarily was when you were 20 to find the energy to keep the shows as energetic as I know they always are? No. Actually, it's hard to find the energy to do everything else. But to get the energy for the shows, not a problem always been there it's just fun i love it i think we put on a really good show um what's hard is to find the energy to you know party all night and wake up early and drive to the next show it's hard to find the time to you know practice or get guys off work to go on a tour you know we have a filling bass player for this tour because our current bass player got a new job with a probation period still in the band kai's great he's well but i miss him you know what i mean it's like been in a band with him for years and now we're getting to the point in our lives where one guy may not be able to be at a tour whereas 10 years ago if you were in the band you were on a tour there were no subs yeah. now it's like oh shit we gotta get a sub you know and there's those are adult problems those are real life issues and i think everybody has them in their own lives and own own lines of work you know it's just you have a little more maybe a little more blind blind not blind but blind ambition when you're younger and then reality kind of hits you down a little bit and then you spend your whole life trying to get back to that ambition that you had you know, you hope at some point there's some type of breakthrough where you're like, okay, it panned out, you know? Yeah, uh, just to kind of start to drop us to a close, can we yeah. expect uh, AOF to keep going for another 15 years, going strong? Yeah, you know what, that is a great question. Um, I certainly hope so. I would love to say that I spent my whole life doing this in, in the face of all adversity, even if it's something like once a year we release a single, or you know, once a year we do a week tour, or hell, worst case scenario, once a year we play a big hometown show. But it would just be great to still do it. Just, just, just to me, it's a big, it's a big middle finger to everybody who doubts anybody being able to do anything. I mean, nobody thought we could take it to this point without any help or serious financial investment. And we have for all these years. So I think it'd be great to be like, hey, it's just a part of my life, and it's what I do. And I may not do it as much as I used to, but it still exists. I'd love to be the band that you can't kill, you know? And then maybe 10 years from now, something super bizarre happens and some song ends up in a movie or a TV show or just something wild. I mean, I just always want to be around in case something crazy happens where Hit the Deck becomes the next download and they want to have a reunion 10 years of all the bands that were originally there. You know, I just you always want to be around for the opportunity. I would hate to think that I would miss something just because, oh, we don't do it anymore, yeah. you know? Well, Noisies UK here at the deck with Chris J. Bellamy Freshman. Thank you very much, Sam, for your, thank you for your time and the philosophical conversation. Yeah, it was a great, it was a great interview. It was very deep. Now I'm all zen right now. Uh, best of luck to your performance later this evening. Thank you very much. And you may be there, right? I am indeed. Okay, because it would be really depressing if we did this whole interview and you talked yeah. about support and happiness and health and really <laughs> believing in bands and then all of a sudden, like, sorry, dude, had to go see Don Bronco. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah.